My name's Ed, the pastor here at the church, and we have an incredible team of volunteers and staff members that have just considered it a great joy to be able to worship and celebrate Christmas to you. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. As you have chosen to make us a part of your tradition, we are very grateful that you are here. And I'd love to begin, first and foremost, with a disclaimer that many of you are jumping into today, particularly to a sermon series that we've called Name Above. It's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 a very familiar prophetic verse that was actually given 700 years before Jesus ever came to a manger in Bethlehem, that Jesus, a son, would be given to us, and the government shall rest upon his shoulders, and you shall call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the gift of Jesus as a present is his presence. And this presence, is four sides in every gift, is an understanding of these titles and these virtues. And today we will talk about the fact that he is the Prince of Peace. But I'd love to begin by way of illustration and introduction, a very familiar story that many of us know from none other than Dr. Seuss himself about how the Grinch stole Christmas. There's a sto story and a statement that actually is quite familiar to all of us. It segues into a Christmas story. Here's the reason why. Because how many of us are reminded that Christmas is not about bags and tags and gifts and products, even decorations and trees? How many of us would know that the reason for this season is the gift of Jesus? And the tree is not a Christmas tree. It's the cross of Calvary that reminds us that there's salvation and there's freedom and there's forgiveness and there's hope and there's meaning and there's destiny that this world cannot give you. That you and I must understand the greatest gift of all cannot be bought, it's to be received. And it's by grace. But the story of the Grinch that steals Christmas, mischievous he was, even fooling and convincing little Cindy Lou that actually he was Santa, sent to fix a light bulb and repair a Christmas tree and in reality stole every gift from the Who's in Whoville. But much like Dr. Seuss in rhyming format, he gets to the very top of his mountain peak home, looking down on the valley of Whoville, and this is where we begin to hear. It says, though all the who's down in Whoville will begin to cry boo-hoo. That's a noise the Grinch began to see and desire to hear, and he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. He did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, and then it started to grow, grow, grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why this sound sounded merry, it couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville, the Grinch popped his eyes, then he shook and what he saw was shocking surprise as every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small were singing, watch this, with no presence at all. He hasn't stopped Christmas from coming, it came. Somehow or other, it just came the same. And the Grinch, with his Grinch feet in ice cold snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. As he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore, then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. And here's the reason why I've made this a very part of this message today. Here's the statement. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. The Grinch couldn't stop Christmas. He took everything from them, but yet the Who's of Whoville stood in a circle with no Christmas tree and began to sing with an unspeakable joy. Here's the reason why, because when Christmas really is a, a gift to be received, then we understand that nothing could ever take that gift from you because it is a gift that surpasses all understanding. And when we begin to celebrate who Christ is, that he is the Prince of Peace, if it's okay today, the listener guide that you've been given, I typically teach with fill in the blanks and a listener guide that participates. But to be honest with you, after preaching this a few times, it just hasn't felt like it flows for me. So would it be all right if I don't give you a bunch of fill in the blanks and just really share from my heart today? It's all right. As we look at the word Prince of Peace, the word Prince of Peace has been really interesting to me. Because Jesus is not known as king of peace. If you're, if you're like me, you talk out loud to the Bible. There are moments in my ADD and my ADHD, I'm like, I, I, I thought you're king of peace. Why would you be prince of peace? When we think about prince, we think like junior king. But, but why would he be called prince? 
Because watch this, Jesus, as he came to the hay, would actually come amongst a Roman empire where there would be a king. And he didn't want it to be confused in a political assignment. Jesus did not come to run for office. Jesus did not come to be a part of a political party. There was so much misunderstanding with the term king. But the word prince actually means he came to be ruler, that he is the persona of. The understanding of prince is actually he's the embodiment of the very thing that he is communicating. So when we look at the logo of what prince, or excuse me, peace is, it's not a peace sign, it's not a dove. The dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. But when we see the actual emblem of what peace is, it's Jesus. Jesus, by definition, is peace. Which means that if he's peace, then he actually is the one that's come to bring peace in a worn out world. Can we just be quite honest? This world is absent of peace. The demographic that's actually been known as the most anxious of all human society in the United States of America is living amongst us at 18 to 33 years old. Suicide rates have escalated up to 200%. Anxiety seems as if most people are wrestling with. I'm a fellow struggler as well. One out of four people are crippled and paralyzed by stress that they can't even function. There's not enough counselors to meet with everybody. There's not enough prescriptions to seem to fix everybody. But yet, we find ourselves hoping for something, a remedy. And the answer's here. It came over 2,000 years ago, and his name is Jesus. But we continue to look for many different things to satisfy the, the gaping void in our heart that only Jesus could fill. And we find things, and we feel things, and for a moment it feels good, and then it vanishes, and it flees, and it fades. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change, he's the same. But when we think about who Jesus is, do you know that Jesus didn't come in a time of peace? Jesus wasn't even delivered in a peaceful way. There's nothing peaceful about a woman who's nine months pregnant having to ride a donkey for a long ways and then finding no place to give birth to her child. Jesus actually born in a feeding trough. No room in the inn. When you think about the three wise men that came to see Jesus, do you notice that they bring gold? Which were all about the gold. How about the frankincense and aroma and incense? But do you know that the third item that was brought to Jesus was a statement that he was born not for peace, but actually unto death. What was that third item? It was myrrh. Do you know that myrrh was used for the embalming of the dead? Could you imagine being a mother and you received this gift? This was not on your registry. You weren't you were hoping for myrrh, but you got myrrh as a statement that Jesus, watch this, in his death would come to bring peace for all people. When we think about even Simon the prophet as Jesus was offered in the temple, do you know that Joseph and Mary were so broke that they only could afford a sacrifice of a pigeon? They couldn't even afford to give a worthy sacrifice. But the prophet named Simon would speak this over Mary, that there'd be a sword that would pierce your soul. The Bible would teach that Mary would contemplate and reflect and ponder on these things. She knew that the gift of Jesus was such a precious gift, not unto herself, but to the whole world. But there would be such heartbreak and heartache. And this is the story of Christmas. It wasn't peaceful, but Jesus came to bring peace. But do you know that the title and the term prince not only signifies his humility, his servitude. He would wrap a towel around his waist and wash the feet of the disciples. He lived a life where he chose to be around people that oftentimes were marginalized and outcast. In proximities of the leper, do you, do you know that the leper specifically had to ring a bell to say unclean, unclean, and kept everybody at a six feet distance, but Jesus, in a moment to heal a leper, would actually step inside the six foot radius and put his hands on him and say, be healed. That's the Jesus that we speak of. Every space he stepped into, he changed the atmosphere. To those with sickness and disease, he brought peace. To those that found themselves riddled with the reality of heartbreak in such a level that they never thought they'd get on the other side, he brings peace. To those that were possessed by demons, he brought peace. This is who Jesus is. Every space he walked into, he ushered in peace. This is Jesus. The word shalom is such a beautiful word. And I'd love for us to be able to just say this out loud. Let's practice our Hebrew together. I want you to look at your neighbor on either side and just say shalom. 
I want you to look to your other neighbor, not to leave them out. Just say the word again, shalom. It sounds good, doesn't it? On the count of three, let's say this out loud together. One, two, three, shalom. It just sounds good. It just has a beautiful sound to it that actually is a greeting of hello and goodbye. But do you know that the word shalom is not the absence of pain? The word shalom is not the absence of conflict. The word shalom does not mean the absence of adversity or affliction. The word shalom is an inner peace even though there's an outer chaos. It's the understanding that you are complete, you are made whole, that there is purpose, there is harmony, there is completion, there is contentment, that everything around you could be shaking and rattling and rumbling, but yet on the inside, there's an anchor that holds you so close. This is the peace that Jesus offers. This is who he is. Moms and dads, you ever had the moment, I thought it was really interesting this morning. I know there were some moms and dads that probably had some little ones crawl into the bed with you this morning because the sound of some thunder. Isn't it interesting on Christmas Eve, we wake up to the sound of rain and thunder. And many children probably crawled into a bed early this morning because of the sound that caused such great fear. Isn't it interesting that children will leave their bed and crawl into another bed it's not the mattress, it's not the covers, it's not the sheets, it's not the pillows, it's you. Peace is a person in a place where there's comfort. It doesn't mean that there's the absence of a storm, it just means that there's a peace in the midst of the storm and there's the mindset of a child that goes, if I could just get next to mama, if I could just get next to daddy, then everything's gonna be okay. Now you won't be able to go back to sleep, but your children, the moment they slide into that bed, it's interesting, within like five seconds, they have gotten to a deep rim sleep that you wish you could go back to. But that's shalom. The understanding that yes, there's adversity, yes, there's challenges, but there's a hope within it all. But do you know that Jesus came to give us more than just tranquil peace in the midst of affliction? Jesus came to give us peace in our soul with God Almighty. Psalm 5, 4 says, God cannot look upon evil. Heaven is perfect. And therefore, if we want to go to heaven, and I know all of you do, how do we get to a perfect heaven when we're not perfect people? Jesus came to give us peace. Peace with who? God. I know this is gonna sound really, really difficult to explain, but in and of ourselves, we are actually at war with God, at enemy with God. Our sin, our rebellion, our desires to do things our way stands in opposition against God's perfect plan, which by the way, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no heart has perceived the good plans that God has for you. But if you're like me, sometimes you think you know best. Sometimes you think you got it figured out. Sometimes you think you could do it the way that you want to do it. And then oftentimes we find ourselves going, I wish I would have trusted God and his plan. But there's a God of second chances. There's a God of third chances. There's a God of multiple chances that continues to move you into a perfect plan who's so patient with you. His peace towards you is the fact that he wants you to be in re right relationship with a God above you who wants you to one day live with him in a place called heaven. One day, God will bring peace to this world. One day, he'll restore us back to the original garden plan in Genesis chapter one, where there is no tears, no more death, no more sickness, no more pain, no more anguish, no more empty seats at a table, no more wondering what tomorrow holds, that we will actually rule and reign with God forever, but we can't get there based upon religion. Oftentimes, there's, an, there's a, a term that's used that many roads get to heaven, and many people will use an analogy that everybody's got a different religion, and all of us go up a different pathway to get up to the top of the mountain, but at the end, we all get God. Can I just say this to you? The movement of Jesus Christ is not just one pathway of many pathways, it's the only pathway. But it's not me working up a mountain to get God, it's God coming down a mountain to get me that he would jump over every mountain. He'd kick down every door. There's no sin you've ever committed that Jesus can't forgive. And this peace that he gives surpasses all understanding. It allows us to understand that the promise and the premise of who Jesus is as the gift, that he's the one that puts the world back together again. 
There's an illustration of a father that was trying to appease his little girl that just seemed to not give him a moment to read the magazine he wanted to read. So he tears out a page out of the magazine. It was a picture of planet Earth. He tore it into several microscopic pieces and all of a sudden gave her the assignment of putting the world back together, thinking it would take her at least 10 minutes. It only took her about 90 seconds. All of a sudden, as she brings the completed picture back, he said to his little girl, sweetie, how did you do this so quick? She made the statement. She said, daddy, what you didn't know is on the other side of the page that you tore out, it was a picture of the face of Jesus. And all I did was I just put his face back together and that's what put the world back together. When I heard that story, I thought the way that sometimes we get our broken lives back together again is that we got to look at the face of Jesus. See, that's why Isaiah 26 verse three says, he keeps in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. Do you know the most highlighted verse in 2023 right now? How many of you use the Bible app? Would you just raise your hand? What a convenient tool this is. Do you know that they're keeping track of all the highlighted verses? And actually the number one highlighted verse in 2023 is Philippians 4, 6 that says, do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, the peace of God shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I believe that many of you in this room find yourself in a situation where you need peace, that you've been through some things in 2023. There's been some challenges that feel so insurmountable, but because of who Jesus is and what he's done, he's brought peace to each and every one of us. But I'd love just to help us understand something, that this peace that Jesus gives us as a relationship with God the Father is not just a vertical peace that we get with God, but it leads us to have a horizontal peace with people around us. See, when we got peace with God, then we wanna be at peace with those around us. In Matthew chapter five, verse nine, it says, blessed are the peacemakers. It actually would say in another Bible verse, if it's all possible, choose to be at peace with other people, that you and I must do everything we can to be at peace with those around us. Why? Because we have peace. Jesus, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking about eating some pie later on today and tomorrow, but Jesus didn't give us a sliver of the peace of peace. He gave us the whole piece of peace. Are you with me? He gave us the whole pie of peace. He gives all of it to us. Which means that you and I, when we think about this peace that we have in Christ Jesus, that he is the fullness of peace. Here's the promise I want you to know that the devil has tried to do a lot of things to distract and detour you from the peace that God wants you to have. But I love Romans 16 verse 20. It says, and may the God of peace crush Satan underneath your feet, that you can walk in victory in 2024. We're believing for a better year. We're believing for better days. But I also know that many of you face some challenges, some trials and adversity. Do you know this verse in John 16, verse 33? Jesus says, unto you, I give you my peace. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. What's the statement that we gotta hang on to? What's the anchor for us in the midst of the storm? That we're gonna face some challenges, but he's the one that allows us to overcome by giving us his peace. I'd love to close with this illustration. There was a moment where there was a, a competition for, for two paintings to be presented as a final winner. One painting was tranquil. It was a body of water. It was a pond. It, it was so elegant, so calm. It was almost like a reflection that you could see your face in. It was a hillside of green pastures, sheep grazing on the hillside. There was a sun that was setting and there was a mountain range in the background, a birch tree even leaning into this calm body of water. Everybody that was voting on this picture of peace said, this has to be it. We don't even need to look at the second painting. This is the painting of peace. The second painting that was revealed stood in juxtaposition. Actually, it was the opposite. It was a painting of, of a rapid waterfall coming off this mountain range, collapsing down on the rocks beneath, a violent storm, thunder and lightning. The question was asked, how could this be the picture of peace? And don't miss this, everybody look right here. There was a moment where the judge said, I saw something you did not see. I wanna show you a picture. Jack Dawson gave a rendering of this particular story. And as you look to this picture, of what would be considered peace in the storm. This painting is known as peace 
in the storm. And you look at this painting, you go, there's nothing peaceful about this. But if you zoom in really, really close, you'll see a dove in the cleft of a rock, protected, safe. The story goes on that the truest definition of shalom peace is not the absence of storms. How many of you have been through some storms in 2023? Peace is not the absence of storms. It's having a safe place to go when you go into the storm that you know that you are safe and you are secure and know that you have a refuge to face the storm. That's why Jesus is called Prince of Peace. This week, I've been battling the flu. I'm on the other side, so we're good for those of you on the front row right now. <laughs> Praise God for doctors in medicine. But it allowed me to have a moment just to reflect and to think about some of the things that I've been praying for you about. I've tried to be a pastor, to pray for people in the hallways, to respond to people on Instagram, to let people know that you matter. And I know for some of you that you're new here, you go, okay, I, we just expected you to say that. But this week I was reflecting on some things and, and I, I wrote something down and would it be okay? They tell you in communication classes, never take your eyes off the audience, but I, I, I wanted to read something to you because they're more than just words. These are actually, every line that I read, there's a face, there's a name that stands out to me. And I wrote something entitled, Jesus is greater because he's my Prince of Peace. And I would love for you as you hear it today, if there's something that resonates with you, would you just even feel compelled to stand and go, yeah, that, that's me. That Jesus is greater. Let me read. Jesus is greater than my anxiety that scares you. Jesus is greater than the anorexia that weighs you. Jesus is greater, greater than the bulimia that compares you. Jesus is greater than the cancer that eats at you. Jesus is greater than the condemnation that reminds you. Jesus is greater than the criticism that mocked you. Jesus is greater than the divorce that about killed you. Jesus is greater than the dead end job that didn't see you. Jesus is greater than the exhaustion that won't let you. Jesus is greater than the finances that limit you. Jesus is greater than the fears that cripple you. Jesus is greater than the grocery bills stacked against you. Jesus is greater than the guilt that haunts you. Jesus is greater than the grief that rocks you. Jesus is greater than the hurts that hurt you. Jesus is greater than the habits that own you. Jesus is greater than the hangups inside of you. Jesus is greater than the injustices done to you. Jesus is greater than the judgments towards you. Jesus is greater than the thing that someone kept from you. Jesus is greater than the lawsuit filed against you. Jesus is greater than the person that laughed at you. Jesus is greater than the mercy taken from you but not shown to you. Mercy, mercy, mercy. When you and I think about the Jesus that's greater, I lost my place, but I'm sorry. That Jesus is greater than those that never noticed you but only rejected you. Jesus is greater than the oppression. And I'm thinking about some people right now. The oppression that you see that no one else sees and they call you crazy because you see it. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than the pain that's been put on you. Jesus is greater than the quiet place that, that you seem that you can't get to. Jesus is greater than the restlessness that won't let you go to sleep inside of you. Jesus is greater than the stress piled on stress on top of you. And this is for somebody, and I'll wrap this up. Jesus is greater than the tears that won't dry up rolling off your face from you. Jesus is greater for the person that's waiting for someone to come, but they've not come yet to you. 
Jesus is greater than the years that have been stolen from you. Jesus is greater. And the reason why I wanted to read this is because Prince of Peace weaves through every one of these circumstances and even ones that I have unintentionally left out. And I need you to know that shalom is not the absence of these things. Shalom is Jesus that goes, we'll go through these things. We'll go through the anxiety. We'll go through the anorexia. We'll go through the bulimia. We'll go through the cancer. We'll go through the condemnation. We'll go through the criticism. We'll go through the divorce. And it just goes through the list. He goes, I go with you through all of it, through all of it. And I don't know another gift I could give you that will do that for you. This gift is the gift of Jesus. Let's all stand together if you don't mind with heads bowed, eyes closed today. If you want to put your faith and trust in who Jesus is and what he's done. This salvation prayer is a prayer of salvation, calling on the name of Jesus making him your personal Lord and Savior. It's choosing to follow him, to live for him, to say yes to him. It doesn't mean that you'll get it right and perfect. It just means that Jesus is now your Savior, knowing that you have purpose and meaning. And one day, if you were to die, heaven is your home. And if you want to receive Jesus, let's pray this prayer out loud. Let's say this so loud that it'll give somebody to pray this prayer in courage and faith. Let's say this out loud together. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. Save me. Change me. I give you my life. If you prayed that prayer in faith and you're in our overflow space, our lobby space, or in this space or online, right where you're at, just lift your hand going, I gave my life to Prince of Peace today. Hold your hand up real tall, elbow above your ear. Come on, we got to celebrate new sons and daughters to the family of God today. His goodness, His faithfulness. We're so proud of you. Next weekend, we'll have a baptism service and we'd love to tell your story. But if you have a communion packet right now, I'd love for you to grab that as we now enter into a time of communion. Let me just go ahead and give the warning disclaimer. This could be a little bit tricky to get to. There's two layers and levels to this communion packet. There's the blister pack that's clear that'll allow you to get to the bread. Would you go ahead and take that out? And go ahead and put your pride aside. If you need help, go ahead and ask your neighbor. Love thy neighbor right now. I probably should have thought about this a little earlier than this weekend. But at the last service, everybody look right here if you can. I know some of you are still trying to get to the bread. I probably should have thought about this earlier, but I'll, I'll never not see this again. You know, when you see something, you can't unsee it. Christmas, Easter. Christmas, Easter. Jesus became flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Christmas. Jesus, the symbolism of the blood, died on a cross. It was raised from the dead on the third day, Easter. Christmas, Easter. We got no Easter without Christmas. And there is no Christmas and the significance of it without an Easter. And so today as we hold up the bread as a statement of thanksgiving that he would become Emmanuel, God with us, could we eat in remembrance of Jesus today? And if you're able to get to the second layer, of the cup, which could be even more trickier. As we hold up our cups in a statement of a toast, you go ahead, are we toasting Jesus right now? Yeah, we are. Let me tell you why. Because I know that somewhere along the line, by the way, to be a part of CBC, and this family, you don't, you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion here. I also know that the requirement to take communion is to have given your life to Jesus. None of us are perfect. We all fall short. Someone has probably said to you along the way that you've done something 
that has disqualified you from taking communion, but I need you to know that Jesus canceled all of our sin, past, present, and future, and all of us are welcome to the table of God if we've said yes to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And because of that, we hold up our, our glasses high. Come on, let's all participate. Here's the reason why. This is a part of our tradition. We hold up our glasses high because we do not drink in shame. We don't drink as sinners. Though we sin, that's not our identity. We're sons and daughters and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We are victors in who Christ is, more than conquerors who Christ has called us to be. And because of that, we drink in freedom and forgiveness. Drink, my brothers and sisters. And for those of you that are new and you're hearing the sounds of people trying to crunch the communion cup, it's an interesting, let me explain this. At CBC, we have a lot of different traditions. But prior to COVID, we used to pass plates with the communion bread and then also the cup. And then obviously we had to change this to more of a streamlined approach. But I used to say this statement when we take communion, that Jesus takes broken pieces and makes masterpieces. And to remind ourselves of that, we would crack the communion cup. And still today, people continue to try to crack the communion cup, but you, 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 can't, you can't break the Tupperware of this cup. And I said this at the eight o'clock service and, and I just pray to God that this at some level would just be a principle that you could live by. That as you can't break this cup, I need you to know that no weapon formed against you shall break you. I need you to know that because Christ is in you, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And though you may face trial, tribulation, affliction, sickness, and even death, death does not win. Jesus is victorious. And because of that, he is our Prince of Peace and we can face all things. So we're gonna sing unto him, giving him glory and honor that Jesus paid it all. So Father God, receive worship, receive praise, receive honor, receive glory. You're worthy. No one has the name that's above all names except Jesus. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen and amen. Come on, let's sing this together. Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe my sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow oh come on with hands held high all over this place let's give him praise today say and oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead oh praise the Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. And Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Come on, can we give him thanks and praise in this place today? Amen.
Well, church, we have uh, a Christmas Eve tradition where uh, we, we close our time singing Silent Night together. Now, we'd love to pass out 3,500 candles in the room, but this room would get burned down, like without a doubt. So what we're gonna do instead, when we get to this last verse, we'll sing three verses. When we get to this third verse, that'll be your cue. These stage lights will turn off and, and just the sound of our voices alone with the lights uh, from our phones, we'll close our time singing together, all right? Come on, let's sing this again. Merry Christmas, CBC.